Lessons from the life of Sam. bearing toward him, I speculate from what we read about their wantonness, idolatry, in that they encouraged this in the people and corruption, I presume they thought they were rightful successors of Eli. This idolatry in the nation was one of the chief tasks that Samuel actively preached against encouraging the nation towards godliness. But also we know for certain that if Samuel had similar traits, it would have been revealed, same as theirs were but we read, between the lines mostly, of that quiet servitude to Eli and the things of the Temple Sea, 1 Samuel chapter 2. We can safely attribute his salvation to his call, but somehow he was a dutiful child. I for one am a firm believer that gentleness towards a child, not proposing we exclude discipline altogether, has a forming effect on them. Love breeds love and vice versa, of course. A Samuel was prayerful from when he was taught by Eli and throughout his life. We read of his prayer as instructed by Eli and subsequent dealings with him by God. He must have been at the point of prayer very often to have received tasks of God and also to have so gracefully handed over the reign to Saul without rancor, bitterness, longing and looking back. This also reflects his dependence on God rooted in faith and the power of prayer and God's providence. He was obedient, and rarely do we read of him complaining when asked to go on arduous journeys mainly by foot. We can deduce this from the disdain the people had for God's ordinance by their comparison of the lowly status of the prophet to the surrounding pagan kings, which resulted into their longing for a king, a form of idolatry in itself, uh, not only at God's ordinances, but the one who was before their eyes day and night on whom they vented their frustrations by disobedience knowing. Asking for a king meant Samuel's demotion, and disrespect after an arduous journey, not hospitality but suspicion and querying. Comest thou peaceably from 1 Samuel 16, 4. He was an exemplary leader, as we shall also see afterwards with a lot of integrity, moral and spiritual, contrasting sharply to King Saul. 
Despite all these, Samuel executed his office with dignity, quiet strength, trust in God, whom he knew for so long, carrying out every task, sermons to the people, inner peace, this can only be as we read of his deportment. Not once did he display anger toward the ungrateful people. Oh, that we could have this trait of Samuel. He was mightily used of the Lord, and you see how well. The land had relative, one main enemy, Philistines, peace during his tenor. He was salt in the land so much so, that the rightful king was his privilege to anoint. The scene in Jesse's house. Wouldn't it have been good to be there, except that it was, and supposed to be, a private affair? He arrives and discloses his mission without fanfare. The kingmakers of our days are quite pompous and do not hide that they are VIPs. Not Samuel, he comes, states his mission. He was instrumental in seeing the two kings. Now that is some privilege. Many of us hanker to see our children's wedding, grandchildren, posterity in general, but he, the posterity of the nation of the Lord, was entrusted to him twice one to dishonor and the other to honor. He remained faithful to God in this task amid great political change in the nation of Israel. And when he asked if there were any other sons, I believe the Cinderella story was somewhat stemmed from this episode. Because when he stated his mission, poor Jesse was so sure it would be the eldest as per tradition. But our God is sovereign and exemption are his prerogative, that he did not assemble all his sons. Now don't get me wrong, David, as we read, was reliable, resourceful, skillful, showed ability and keenness, was an obedient child in so much that Jesse appointed him keeper of the flock. Not sure what other brothers were doing, but we can glean from the rebuke of David by one of his brothers at the David and Goliath incident what they really thought of him. Maybe a tad similar to Joseph and his brothers, though the opposite was the case there when it came to care of the flock but resourceful for sure as he was the only one away keeping the flock. Anyhow, plenty to write and speculate here, but back to our narrative, are here all thy children? From 1 Samuel 16.11 Now that is faith in God's word, that it will not return unto him void. God had sent him, so the future king is there. The question was almost rhetorical. I would dare to rephrase, where is your other son? See. The family must have known straight away that David was the one I wonder what went through their minds in that moment. David, that braggart, show off, this is so much what his brother said of him, will be king. We also note that from then on, they weren't mentioned in the Bible anymore, so that is rebuke enough for them. Anyhow, he was faithful, Samuel, patient, obedient, carried out his task simply. He did not come with an entourage. Yes, it was a kind of secret but that he was able to keep it, speaks volume. In exercising his office of prophet, he was steadfast rebuking King Saul for disobedience to God, and showing leaders are to be accountable in their exercise of ruling the nation, God's chosen race. All these traits are worthy of our emulation. To write about Samuel is volume in itself. We see that his siblings were rebuked by no mentions, and Samuel elevation, despite their cruel ridicule of Hannah, and today, Hannah was within her rights to exert punishment, but she poured out her heart to the Lord. There is that saying amongst men, of the dog with her whelps laughing, that she had many and the lion only one, to which the lion said in so few words, maybe, but he is a lion, a lion. This seems to be the case with Samuel and his siblings. We are to bear our trials prayerfully, like mother, like son, cry if we must, not crocodile ones, and to the Lord and Him alone. He is able to reward and exceed our best expectations. We are to expect arduous labor for the Lord, bear much insult, ridicule and hatred when we sincerely engage in His work, especially from those whose mind are full of the world. We should not expect to be born on beds of ease to heaven. The curse that we are to serve with sweat still holds. My yoke is easy. Burden light, see Matthew 11.30, still holds, yoke and burden are there, though lighter we must recall the parable of the master and the tired servant who must serve still despite his tired state. See Luke 17, 7, 8. We are to labor in discipline of ourselves control and of our home if we are homeowners, to labor in prayer and worship and service and witness and work wherever we are placed, for he who does not work must not eat. See 2 Thessalonians 3, 10. Nancy, 
to resist temptation and devil until resistance be a permanent feature that the devil flees. We are to labor in faith, trusting the Lord that he gives, and none of his shall ever lack bread. See Psalms 37, 25, and if it means we give much to the work, alleviate the poor's distresses in so much that it is our last farthing we are to do so. Give for the proclamation of the gospel, despite that being the hardest fight as the place where the devil presents his strongest forces, and we may suffer health, wealth, persecution, distress, even martyrdom for his namesake. Patience should be our ruling character, that quiet dependence upon the Lord in all aspects of our life, especially as we battle our besetting sins. Here this hallmark is one of a lifetime, and if we let slip, our latter years may be more painful than the earlier ones. This may surprise you, correlation between patience and battling against the onslaught of sins, but this is where Satan is at his most subtle, and we need to be wise as serpents and patient as doves. Our best watching is here. Many have fallen at this point, so we must warn diligently. We are to be children of prayer, relying on God's providence as we demonstrate in our lives the power that emerges in exercise of this communicative privileges. Not forgetting abstinence from the idols for our day which are as rife as theirs and may not be effigies, but the technology, people, business moguls, power merchants, wealth and the trappings of riches. We tend to idolize in our day, especially that of the unknown God, as in we ignore God, yet clamor for a peaceful, crime-free, and a society according to our corrupt tastes. And as Samuel, one of the most faithful prophet, peaceful and lived his life in peace of the Lord. And as we see, peace does not mean ease, for we see his labors, travails for the people, even his tears, the beauty of his obedience, his vindications, deportment, trusting fully in the Lord until the end so much so, Saul wouldn't leave him alone, and he came, off duty, still working. And we learn that we can emulate a life of obedience, uncorrupted leadership and faithfulness to God in our spiritual journey till Shiloh come.